One more time. Okay, so in a, you know, for better or worse, in random matrix theory, this question of universality is a, um, you know, the driving force. So I thought I should talk about what you can do in the context, you know, using this operator limit approach to get at universality questions. So um, universality can mean a couple different things depending on your worldview, right? So if you start with something like GUE, where all the entries are Gaussian because you like Gaussians and all this magic happens because it's integrable, um, you take one person, they might say, universality should mean, you still see Cyan kernel, Tracy Wood, and what have you. You take the Gaussians and replace them by something else, Bernoulli's or whatever. That's not what we're gonna talk about, right? So the other, the other worldview um, is, you know, you, you think of GUE, you know, the way Wigner was really thinking about it through this kind of measure on matrices point of view, right? Here's a way to write GUE, and we expressed it earlier in my talk, says, you know, you fill up a Hermitian matrix with I, D complex Gaussians everywhere you can, except that you want the symmetry. So DM is a is Lebesgue measure, indicates Lebesgue measure in the space of N by N Hermitian matrices. And you, know, you would like to grab the typical Hermitian matrix, so you would love just to use DM, unfortunately that's not a probability measure, so you gotta do something. And, you know, from some point of view, the easiest thing to do would be to put some um, you know, quadratic potential against the flat measure, and that's, that happens to be GUE. You know, if you expand out trace m squared, you know, you'll find that that means that all the entries are IID complex Gaussians, right? So if that's your point of view, what you want to perturb, or, you know, get away from is the quadratic potential, right? So universality will mean you replace the, the x squared potential with some, some v, right, that maybe is growing sufficiently large at plus and minus infinity, so the, uh, the ensemble makes sense. And again, you want to ask, do you have universality at the level of local, of local fluctuations? All right, so does this alter local statistics? Okay, and you know, the, the important thing is in this context, when you do this, you have the exact same sort of analytic structure um, that you did behind GUE. These are again, not as solvable in a sense, but they're solvable models regards the spectrum. You can induce, you can figure out the induced eigenvalue density, and it looks like the exact same thing and the reason is, is because what, you know, when you go from eigen, you know, entry data to eigenvalue eigenvector data, the, the real magic was the Jacobi and the DM, right? This e to the minus trace V of M just goes along for the ride. That's here, and it's the same Jacobian calculation that was behind GUE. So nothing changes except instead of a Gaussian weight on each eigenvalue coordinate, you have this e to the minus NV on each eigenvalue coordinate. And so again, this is a determinantal object. And you know the right way to write <clears throat> to write GUE, the GUE density, was as the determinant, you know, this n by n determinant where each entry, the ij entry, is a fixed kernel operator at lambda i, lambda j, and that kernel operator was the projection under the span of the first n Hermit polynomials, and you use Hermit polynomials because those are the dudes that orthogonalize the Gaussian weight on the line. Now you just have, you know, you just follow your nose. So the right thing to do, apparently, is to use the family of orthogonal polynomials that orthogonalize the weight e to the minus nv on the line. All right, so all that structure goes, just goes through. I mean, of course, the problem is <clears throat> those aren't a classical, you know, um, in a classical family of orthogonal polynomials. So there is work to be done, right? But it's just sticking for, and this is where the Riemann-Hilbert problem method comes in a moment that I'll just mention. I was thinking for you know, beta and two for a moment, right? In the, again, the mantra is all local statistics of the spectrum really turn into universality questions on a family of orthogonal polynomials, right? If you can track the asymptotics of this family of orthogonal polynomials sufficiently, you can say things about the spectrum, right? And you know, this big paragraph, and the most important thing is that I say, and the mighty hammer that is the Riemann-Hilbert problem method has basically settled this once and for all, right? This is where the Riemann-Hilbert method comes in. And if there's any subtlety, you know, what, you know, what, kind, what kind of universality results can you get? What you have to think about, or you don't have to think about it, but one thing to keep in mind is you don't want to ask, where do you expect to see universality, right? So say, in these kind of ensembles, we only have bulk and edges, right? You know, bulk and possibly soft edges. <clears throat> and what's not universal is the global statistic. So for GUE, the counting measure of eigenvalues is, um, 
sorry, what do you call it? The semicircle law, yes? <laughs> now, when you perturb away and you have some measure of general potential V, you don't, you don't get semicircle anymore, right? What you get is you get this so-called equilibrium measure that is the solution of this variational principle, right? And all kinds of things can happen. When V equals X lambda squared, the solution to this is the semicircle law. So this is one way to understand what happens to the, the counting measure of eigenvalues. But, you know, wild things can happen. So even for smooth V, you can get a counting measure of eigenvalues that has many bands of support, right? And there's all sorts of, you know, there's a deep theory here and tons of work. I mean, even for smooth Vs, you can get infinitely many bands of support. Um, so you can have three bands of support, like I indicated here. But when I, when I, when, what weird things can happen, and we'll get to this hopefully at the end, is you could have something like this. This is, a, well, this is what I mean by, what I'll mean by a regular picture. These, these three lumps I've drawn, they're supposed to look like three semicircles. <laughs> Meaning inside, they're, you know, they're support, they're strictly positive, and they vanish like a square root at their edges, right? But you could have something like this. You could have some bad behaving equilibrium measure where you vanish inside the band of support. All right, so this is irregular. Here's another version. You probably can't see this. Yeah, I should lift this up. Other things can happen. You can have just one density, one band of support, rather, but instead of vanishing like a square root, you vanish, you know, that's supposed to indicate you vanish faster than a square root, right? So this isn't a bulk point, right? And this isn't a soft edge point. So in points like here and here, you don't expect universality. You're going to get other, other local limit theorems. But if you're at an edge that looks like a, that, that vanishes like a square root, vanishes like the semicircle law, you expect to see Tracy with him. And if you're at a bulk point where the density is really strictly positive, you expect to see sine kernel. And there's a huge amount of work, you know, with going back to the early 2000s with, you know, Dave Krickerbauer, McLaughlin, Venikiti Joe, and then work of Itzin Blaher, and it goes on from there. And um, there's a huge theory there, right? And, you know, I, beta one and four can be pushed through, and, you know, it's much more complicated, but the structure is there. So there's, there's a universe of beta one, two, four universality through through orthogonal polynomials, right? So, you know, it's a pretty complete, beautiful theory. So what happens when you, you know, what's the natural question now? You wanna generalize both the potential and beta, right? Because these beta ensembles that we've discussed, and today I'll really, I'll, I'll really talk about universality at the soft edge. So you can think we're, we're perturbing away from beta hermit. So beta hermit was like you took GUE and you changed the interaction strength to be Vandermann squared to Vandermann and the beta, and I want to change, I want to have Vandermont to the beta, and I want to have a potential that's different than quadratic, right? So general Coulomb gas, general charge, and general potential. All right. <clears throat> so the random operator approach is available to you, at least in principle, all right? Because for all these ensembles, there is a tridiagonal operator, a tridiagonal matrix model. So here's the deal. So we used this notation before, you know, capital T, A, B, the tridiagonal matrix with random Bs on the off diagonals and A's on the diagonal, main diagonal. A's are real coordinates and B's are, are positive, all right? And here's what you do. You wanna draw A and B, you know, you wanna, I'm gonna put a measure down on A's, capital A's and capital B's. We're just like putting a measure down on these random tridiagonals. Well, a measure down on these tridiagonals, making them random, yes? So here's a density on A's and B's. So I'm using capital A and capital B for the random variable, and this is their joint density, up to some constant. All right, e to the minus n beta trace. I take this tridiagonal matrix, and I apply its B to it, and then I take its trace, and then I have product of the B's raised to these funny powers, all right? And the fact is, is that if you built a tridiagonal matrix according to that kind of Gibbsian prescription, the joint eigenvalue density is this, okay? which looks just like the thing we had, you know, a slide ago where I just put betas where I used to have twos. And, you know, the proofs, okay, so what I wrote here is you note, if you take V to be the quadratic, um, what do you have here? You go back up here, and if V is quadratic, you compute trace of a tridiagonal matrix, trace squared rather, you get the sum of the A squares, plus twice, twice the sum of the B squares. And there's your independent you know, A's and chi's when you pair the B squared with this, right, on the off diagonals. And that's the Dimitri Edelman ensemble. The proof here is exactly the same. It's kind of like going from the you know, GUE to the general quote unquote unitary ensembles. The only thing that changes, the, I mean, the only thing that moves the Jacobian calculation going DM, 
you know, um, matrix entries, full matrix model entry coordinates to eigenvalue eigenvector coordinates. And now you go from A's and B's to lambdas and quote unquote norming constants, which I mentioned a couple days ago. I mean, you know, it, it got mentioned before. But the Jacobian calculation that's going from this, this object to this object stays the same. And again, this potential bit just goes along for the ride, right? But of course, when you get up to, if you want to work with this random Jacobi matrix with a more general V, um, you know, you get away from IID, or sorry, not IID, you never had IID, but you get away from independent entries. So you just have this kind of Gibbsian prescription on your A's and B's, and things are kind of a mess, right? When, when V is quadratic, you have all these beautiful independent gaussians, independent chi's, now you just have this piece of junk, right? This is some joint density of A's and B's. Okay? Questions? No? All right. Okay. But there is, you know, there, we have this philosophy now, right? I mean, we, um, do we? So the philosophy is you take this random Jacobi matrix and to prove universality, say at the soft edge, what you want to show is you want to say oh, this random Jacobi matrix looks like the um, scales as an operator to the stochastic area operator, right? So you want to take your random Jacobi matrix, peel off a, um, a discrete Laplacian and the rest you, you, you view as potential and you want to show you get the right potential. So at some level, you're trying to prove universality for Tracy Widom by just a functional central limit theorem. You know, you don't, before you got, a, you know, the random potential, which is just a bunch of Gaussians and a bunch of Chi's, those scale to Brownian motion because of the classical central limit theorem. Now you have these A's and B's, and you expect them to still, you know, scale to, to, to Brownian motion. So here's the deal. So what do what I say here? Okay. So you got this random matrix, and you want to show that you get Tracy Woodham. So you want to show you get stochastic area. And you imagine that there is some edge, you know, there's some centering, right? So maybe the picture looks like this. The equilibrium measure has three bumps, yeah? Or 14 bumps. You want to go to the rightmost bump, that's your E, right? That's your centering, okay? So you want to scale the biggest eigenvalue of this matrix, this tridiagonal random matrix around that edge thing. And you expect there is some, there's some scaling rate at which you see stochastic area. So what you would do is you would take, you would scale the whole operator as you would the biggest eigenvalue. So if this is your edge value, which is, you know, you think here qualitatively, you would take that edge value times the identity matrix, subtract off your random matrix and blow it up by what your proposed scaling rate is. And maybe you have to absorb constants, you know, but you, what you, you, you do, you say, okay, what I want is I want a discrete second derivative on some scale, and I'm just, you know, I'm just redefining gamma n times this edge parameter as some mn squared y, because I want to identify, in front of the discrete Laplacian, you're supposed to get your delta x, one over your delta x squared, All right? That's the right scaling. So I'm just giving this a new name to be something quadratic, right? And, you know, the rest, you know, you just, I'm making a definition here of these A's and B tildes, right? This is the junk that's left over, right? After you put in and take out a, um, a discrete second derivative, yeah? And then you say, okay, those A tildes and B tildes, that's your potential, right? And that's the potential that's supposed to scale to linear, a linear term plus white noise, because that's what stochastic area is, but again, you never show something converges to white noise. You know, we don't know. What does it mean to converge to white noise? It means the integral or the running sum converges to Brownian motion. So the meta theorem is that, you know, if you can massage your random tridiagonal matrix to look like so, you focus on the, um, on the, uh, the random, the potential part, and you look at the, all, everything along the diagonal and off diagonal, you get two Bs, right, because there's Bs above and below. You look at the running sum up to a continuum position, up to a continuum T, right? You have to look at T times MN because MN is your one over, one over NM is your discretization length, right? That this object should converge to T squared plus the appropriately scaled Brownian motion. And that would mean that you're looking at stochastic area, right? This is a very rough idea. Okay, and then I write, along with some sufficient compactness, this should mean blah. Right? That should be the lambda max of this object converges to, to Tracy with beta. Right? 
So sufficient compactness is in italics because I, uh, I thought whether or not I should tell you anything about the sufficient compactness. But then I decided I, I would to make it seem like there's an honest theorem behind this, this philosophy. So what, what do I mean by sufficient compactness? Well, this just is showing the potential, I mean, if you could prove this, this, this would show your potential looks like the right thing, but you're trying to prove some kind of operator limit. So you need some compactness of the operator, right? Okay, so here I try to answer the what compactness. And this, this I realize is a little bit hideous after on day four after lunch, but uh, let's, let's try to work through this, all right? Bear with me. All right, so here's, here's, here's something that almost looks like a real theorem. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm re-notating your uh, tridiagonal matrix, okay? And here's the idea. So <clears throat> let's imagine you got this random Jacobi matrix and you're writing the on-diagonal and off-diagonals in the following way, right? Explicitly. So you just rewrite them as here's, you know, on the diagonal you have two times the square of your scaling parameter, first order. On your off-diagonals you have minus scaling parameter squared, right, first order. Together, this and this together, there's your discrete second derivative. And then I, I write the, the next term, which in the previous slide, which would have been your A tildes and B tildes, as scaling parameter times some difference, scaling parameter times a different difference, right? X's, so what I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing, I'm writing it this way, because remember, it's the sum of the guys that should scale to something. So I'm writing each entry as an increment, right? Remember the A tilde, a tilde k, when you sum, you're supposed to see something, order one. So it's, it's, it's a little bit convenient to write the entries as, um, as increments, all right? Okay, so, this, so you may have a matrix model that's of this form, and I'll just use this notation. So x and t, what I'll mean is I look at this vector, I look in the off diagonal entry, this is the, this is the diagonal entry, I apologize, to a continuum position. So I look at index k, which is the scaling at a position t, and similarly with y, all right? So here's what I had on the previous slide is rewritten in a different way, that if I look at this, your process at some continuing position, you should get convergence to this sort of Brownian motion. That, we already said that. So in addition to that, you require the following, and here's the compactness that you need, okay? So you take, your, your process on diagonals, you take your process off diagonals, and you need the following decomposition. And when I say you need this, I mean this is how we wrote our theorem. We need this. This is, this is the conditions we came up with, okay? So you, have a, you decompose the on diagonal process and the off diagonal process as follows. What you wanna think intuitively is that this first bit is a deterministic part, and the second bit is the noise. Right, this is the bit that's gonna to go to the, the T, the linear potential that's compactifying things, and here's the bit that's gonna to go to Brownian motion. All right? Both above and, you know, both for both processes. And you're writing it this way because, right, this is the summed potential. So the noise, you looked at the summed noise, but you're gonna to have to make statements about the actual deterministic potential, not just the summed deterministic potential, the actual running potential, these etas. So here's what you need. You look at the two deterministic parts, and they must be bounded above and below up to constants by T. So this is saying, as N gets large in this random Jacobi matrix, if you wanna get stochastic area in the end, you know, the, the part of your potential that's gonna give you the compactness that's gonna show up as T in the stochastic area, stochastic area is second derivative plus T plus white noise, right? That, that part that's gonna to converge to it, for big enough n, it already looks like t, up to some constants. That's what that's saying, right? You can't have the thing waffling back and forth and oscillating like crazy as n goes to infinity. Eventually it has to settle down to t. All right, so that's all that's saying. This is the interesting, the more interesting statement, all right? And it's, it's ugly to look at, but if you um, remember when we define stochastic area, and then show the convergence of the plain beta Hermita stochastic area. Um, the technical step was that, you know, Brownian motion itself is, oscillates wi widely, wildly enough that we couldn't deal with it. What we could deal with was the increments of Brownian motion. 
So we integrated by parts in stochastic array, or we summed by parts in the beta Hermit, and we replaced dealing with the pointwise random potential with its running increment. You possibly don't remember that, but we did. Right, we did this, okay? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't it wasn't W, right? Dub this W, dude. He's gonna scale to he, you know, he's gonna go to Brownian motion, right? I'm not gonna even try to control him. What I'm gonna try to control are his oscillations. And I want to control its oscillations in terms of the good part of the limiting potential. So what you have to show is that the squared increments of both the, the noise term that comes from the diagonal component, and the noise term that comes from the off-diagonal component, right? It's running some square, so T and S are two time-like parameters that are order one apart. That as T gets large, this is little o of T. So I wrote here that it looks, it's controlled by some big constant times T over phi of T, and phi of T is going to infinity. It means the increments of the noise don't dominate the good part of the potential. If they can, I can't prove compactness, all right? So then you could really make this a theorem. Like if you have a Jacobi matrix, blah, 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 you decompose it like this, you have this convergence, you satisfy these compactness conditions, we have a theorem that says then you look at stochastic area after properly centering and scaling. Yeah. And the thing is there are really random Jacobi matrices that people care about because there are these general V, general beta ensembles that generalize um, say GUE, <laughs> or the general unitary ensembles in, a, in an obvious way. Okay, so here is a statement of a theorem from a few years ago. <clears throat> this is the kind of thing we can prove. And I put a, I, I don't know why I did this now, but I decided to put a lot of more technical mumbo jumbo on the statement of the theorem. I won't read it all, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just get to the, cut to the chase. So here's the basic gist. So we have these tridiagonal matrix models, right, that realize these general beta, general V eigenvalue densities. If V is a strictly convex polynomial, then if you take the Ram Jacobi matrix that realizes this general beta, general V eigenvalue density, there is some centering and scaling of this random Jacobi matrix that you get stochastic area, which means that for at least some family of general betas and general Vs, we converge to Tracy Whitman beta, right? And of course, this is written for, you know, the bottom of the, the you know, any finite levels at the bottom of the spectrum, okay? And then there's some other technical stuff here that you should not pay any attention to. But the take home message is, if you got a polynomial V and um, that's convex, that's, that's pretty not, you know, that, those are two pretty strict conditions that we can push through and get stochastic area convergence. All right. So full disclosure, if you're a fan of universality, there are a lot better universality results out there on the planet now. So right about the same time, two separate groups, so one is Beckerman, Figali, and Giune, and the other is, you know, Bergardi, Erdoshiao, they have different approaches to universality. So Beckerman, Figali, Giune have this transportation measure approach, Bergardi, Erdoshiao, um, I call it here relaxation of Dyson Brown emotion. What though, what say Erdo Xinyao do and Brigade, as you have this ensemble, this measure, you know, this beta, this, this general V, general beta point ensemble, right? And you consider that as the initial data, it's random, but you consider it as the initial data for some dynamical system. That's the Dyson Brownian motion. It's a random dynamical system. And this dynamical system has as its invariant measure GUE. So you take this your random point process and you evolve a little bit, right? And what's amazing about the Dyson Brown emotion is it relaxes to equilibrium incredibly quickly. So after time like one on n, and n is your dimension getting large, you're already in equilibrium, which means your new points after being flo you know, flowed by this Dyson Brown emotion look like they're GUE eigenvalues, right? At the same time you prove You've evolved for such a short time that nothing's changed. That sounds crazy, but that's what the proof says. It says, you know, if you only evolve for a little bit of time, you haven't changed the statistics, but you've already evolved for enough time to get to GUE. So that means that your eigenvalues look like GUE eigenvalues. And of course, I shouldn't say GUE, I should say G beta E here. This is a general beta approach. Um, and both those groups, they only require some number of derivatives on V, right? So like C4 or something. So a far cry from polynomial. But they do require 
some condition, because there has to be some condition on the equilibrium, equilibrium measure, right? You know, going back to this picture where wild, you know, strange things could happen. So both, both groups require um, the equilibrium measure to have one band of support and to be regular, which means it looks not like this, but like a real semicircle, right? It's one band of support, and then the band is like a square root at both points. Okay. But still, that's a, that's, that's a, you know, in terms of universality, that's um, you know, far stronger than what we have. Just um, as an aside, so convexity of the potential is basically the only simple condition. And say, somebody says, well, what kind of these produce regular equilibrium measures with one band of support? Basically, the only nice answer is if V is convex. <laughs> so if V is convex, your equilibrium measure has one band of support and it vanishes like a square root. This, and I'll try to explain how we use those two conditions, convexity and poly, the polynomial uh, nature of V. Um, we don't use it for that, right? So we have a, we have a more probabilistic point of view. But this is where the R2 results line up. Um, you know, if there's any advantage to our method, I probably won't be able to explain today why I think it has advantages. It doesn't seem like it has any advantages because their results are better right, from, the, from the standpoint of universality. But these results of, you know, Beckerman, Figali, and Gine, and these other characters, Bergard, Erdo, Xiao, I mean, these are invariance principles. They're comparison principles. What they do is they say, okay, we know what happens in the Gaussian-like case, in the beta Hermite case, and we can compare our ensemble to what happens there. We don't recompute the limit. We just show whatever the limit is, it has to be the same as what happens in beta Hermite. And there were these other turkeys, that would have been myself and Jose and Balint, we prove what happens in the beta Hermite case. So they're able to show that, that you, know, you can perturb V and you still get the same stuff. Our approach, we find the limit again. Like we reconstruct the limit by hand. Right? So it's, um, it has the advantage that, at least in principle, using the random operator approach, you can start to delve into these more exotic cases, right? These more exotic cases, these comparisons will be very hard, right? But we at least have a, a method to get at these more exotic limits in random matrix theory in the general beta, in this general beta setting. <clears throat> so, yeah, well, boo. When did I stop at 50 after, is that the deal? How does this work? Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I want to try to explain um, how this goes, okay? Okay, <clears throat> so now we have, you know, you forget about the eigenvalue, the eigenvalue like density, and you just have some measure on this space of tridiagonal matrices on your A's and B's, all right? It's kind of a Gibbsian prescription. So. Here, you know, these are the tridiagonal entries of A's, you know, A's on the diagonal, B's on the off diagonal. The measure looks like E to the minus N beta H. We'll call it the Hamiltonian. And here's, here's what your H looks like. All right, all I've done here is exponentiate those, those product of B's to those powers. Okay? So it has kind of a polynomial bit, which is the trace. In this case, because I've taken a polynomial V, this will be some polynomial in A's and B's, right? And then these log factors. Remember that the Bs are strictly positive. As can be positive or negative, but Bs are strictly positive. All right. And what we've assumed, we've assumed again that V is polynomial, and we've assumed V is strictly convex. So here is, um, you know, the good thing about this setup is it's a little theorem going back to what was his name? Something with the C Davis, I believe. It's a cute fact, okay? <laughs> so if you have a symmetric matrix, and then you take a convex function of your matrix, then, then you, you, you look at that, and then you take the trace, and you think about now that's a, a function on the matrix coordinates, that's a convex function of the matrix coordinates, right? Something Davis. So <clears throat> if V is convex, right, on the matrices, on Ts, this is a convex function of A's and B's, okay? And log with the right power is actually convex. So this is a convex Hamiltonian, all right? Okay, so that's a good thing because if you have a measure, e to the minus nh, forget it, don't call it a Hamiltonian, e to the minus some function, right? And it's convex, well, and you got a big parameter n in front, you know, you, you morally know what's happening. Well, everything should concentrate around the minimizer of this function. Right? Okay. 
So you, you, would, it would, you, you know, in principle, it should be, you have a roadmap of how to try to understand these measures. Okay. And then that, that's what, what convexity, get, how convexity gets used. It gets used to say with high probability, all these random entries in your tridiagonal matrix, they're in some small tube around the minimizer of this Hamiltonian. All right. How do we use the, the, the V as polynomial? Why, why is that useful for us? So this gives us kind of a Markov field property. So maybe, um, let me try to write something. Okay. So uh, can you maybe I'll get some white chalk or something? All right. So you have these matrix coordinates, right? A1, A2, A3. No, no, no. B1, B2, B1, B2. Right on. So here's our tridiagonal matrix and a bunch of zeros. And you know, our, the, the point of view here is that you really view this as the stochastic process in the index, right? You're thinking of B1, B2, B3, or right? really A1 plus 2B1 plus A2 plus 2B2. This is your running potential. So you think about the index being like a time-like parameter and you want to sum this up to the continuum position. And you want to prove a central limit theorem for this thing, all right? Now when V is um, quadratic, all those A's and B's are, are independent, right? And if you expand out, say, just think in your, you know, think for a second that V is quartic and you expand out, you know, the fourth power of a tridiagonal, this tridiagonal matrix, you're not going to see A1 talk to A23, right? A1 can only talk to A2, right? A16 can only talk to A17 and maybe B17. What, what I'm saying here is that indices, right, only talk to, you know, a certain number of neighboring indices. And so as I write here, is what happens is there's, a, there's kind of a Markov field property. So if you're viewing this as a process in time, and you condition on some short block of indices, right? So I say I freeze all the A's and B's in some little stretch. Then what happens above, you know, kind of before in this time-like, you know, worldview and, and after is independent, okay? And the block that you have to condition on is one half the degree of the potential minus two. Right? So for example, when V is quadratic, I screwed this up. It's one half in the degree of the potential minus one. <laughs> because when V is quadratic, it's, a, it's Markov, right? They're all IID. And when V is four, I would get two minus one. When V is, sorry, when D is four, these A's and B's actually perform a Markov chain, right? When D is six, you get a two Markov chain or something like this. But you know, this sounds hopeful because you're trying to prove a central limit theorem, so you would like to have some independence built in. So this polynomial nature of the potential, if you assume it, it gives you some, some sort of independence. All right. So that's, these are the good things about our assumptions. Okay, so the, the bad. Um, so I say, yeah, I want to use convexity of H to show that the variables fluctuate in a small window about the minimizer of this, of this Hamiltonian. But look at this bloody Hamiltonian, right? You know, it's, it has n coordinates. I mean, if you say, even if you, if you take V equals X to the fourth power and you write that out, it's pretty disgusting, right? You're never gonna compute the minimizer, like in a million years. So I say, okay, you'll just fluctuate around the minimizer, but if you can't even compute the minimizer, you know, what, you know, what are you gonna do? Does this kind of, you know, just softly make sense? Okay. Um, so I'll try to explain your kind of rough idea of how we get around this. So we, chop, we take this matrix model, right, this running process of A's and B's, and we chop it up into blocks, right? You're not gonna show the whole matrix looks like some sort of Gaussian thing, you know? Or you're not gonna control the fluctuations of all the A's and B's in one go. So take a stretch of coordinates, A, K, B, K, in some, I call it some, you know, math cal I, so some stretch of indices that's of length n to the alpha. And I'm keeping that vague, but alpha, think like alpha is one quarter. It's some small thing. You're not gonna look at all the entries at a time. You're gonna look at some you know, little O of n stretch of the entries, all right? And then what you do is you use this Markov field property. You have this stretch of indices and you condition on the little block of length d, which was, right? one half the degree of the potential minus one to the left and right, all right? 
So you freeze those boundary values to Bs, you call them, I'm calling the boundary values to the left and the right, right? The A's and the B's that I'm fixing, maybe, maybe I condition on this stretch, I fix these A's and B's to be some values and I just call those values, there's some Q. Okay, and then I think of the induced law on the indices in I, the variables in, in, you know, whose indices are in I, right? So they're free to be, right? Except that you know, they're, what they are, you get the Hamiltonian, right? The H, but restricted to the coordinates I. And of course, the Hamiltonian is gonna feel the Q indices at the endpoints. And then you have to average out over the law of Q. All right. So <clears throat> now you can try to use concentration, because the idea is, well, this H sub Q, what, this, what that notation means, it's your original Hamiltonian just restricted, right? This function of all these entries, restricted to some short range, and you freeze the indices outside the set you're looking on. Yeah, so this is also a convex function, also a convex function. So now, by general concentration, you should be able to just show that this convex function also lives in a small window around its minimizer. But of course the minimizer, it, this is, sound, is gonna sound like it gets worse because this minimizer is gonna depend on the boundary conditions, okay? So it sounds like I'm going backwards. And I am a bit, right? So, but what you can do is you say, well, you do the obvious thing. You tell or expand the Hamiltonian, right? So I'm just gonna try to do stationary phase. I mean, people talk about the Riemann-Hilbert approach as being a nonlinear stationary phase. The point I'm trying to make here, in, in these coordinates, in these tridiagonal coordinates, you can prove universality by honest to God classical stationary phase. Right? I'm just gonna do a Gaussian approximation of this, of this big animal. And what I'm writing here, so I, you know, I didn't have much room on the slide, so this H bar is supposed to be the Hamiltonian, the conditional Hamiltonian, evaluated at its minimizer, right? Its minimizer is AQ, BQ. I can't compute this thing, but this is just generic. I'm just Taylor expanding this object and what you can prove is if you take a small stretch, you can really just go out to second order and everything else is small, all right? So you can really do this. You can prove that with high probability, these entries in this small window will live close enough to their minimizers that you can throw out all the higher terms in the Hamiltonian except the quadratic, all right? So let's pretend you can do that. And what do you got? If I replace the Hamiltonian, the general H, with this, that's a, that's, a, that's a Gaussian measure, right? So what you're showing is you're showing on any block, right? S suitably small block, right, and to the alpha. Those entries, not only do they start to look like Gaussians, you know, something that could be Brownian emotional limit, for all large n, their, their measures just look like Gaussian measures, all right? But of course, it's a mixture of Gaussian measures that depend on these conditional objects who you still can't compute, right? So it doesn't look like, so this is what I said, this will yield that PI, the measure on any block is sufficiently, you know, that's sufficiently small, you can show in total variation norm that it's a mixture of Gaussians, right? So that, on one hand, that sounds great, and the, why it sounds bad is that it doesn't look very universal because we have the problem of quote unquote computing these conditional minimizers. The, the statistics depend on the boundary conditions, okay? So we have a Gaussian, but we have no idea what Gaussian. But here's the philosophy, so I'll try to just, maybe I'll just try to talk about this and stop it and tend to, because this is, I know this stuff is kind of, I mean, it's not, it's, on one hand, this approach is elementary, but it's, it's, it's technical and uh, not fun to sit through. So here's the idea. The idea is that, okay, you got these blocks, and they're evolving, you know, they're, they're, the, the variables in there are fluctuating, around some minimizer, but this minimizer implicitly depends on how you conditioned on the outside, yeah? Well, we're trying to prove universality, so even if the minimizer seems to depend on the conditioning on the endpoints, it must not, right? It actually mustn't, right? So how do you, you know, how, do you, how would you go about proving that? So the idea is that, well, you know, these, these functionals, these H must be so nice that even these conditional minimizers look the same right, no matter what you condition on, unless the conditioning is crazy, right? 
So what should they look like? Well, maybe they should look like the true minimizer. Well, you can't, you know, we started saying, well, we can't compute the true minimizer, so that's a reasonable thing for them to look like, the global minimizer, but you can't compute that one either. So we introduced this notion of a, the local minimizer, right? And the idea is, right, <clears throat> if you're looking at a small block of A's and B's, right, that you would expect the minimizing profile to be smooth. What does smooth mean? We learned from calculus that smooth means constant, locally. Right? So like basically locally, the minimizer shouldn't move. All right? So we should be able to kind of, in, in essence, localize the Hamiltonian to something of very low order, do an actual calculation, and, and put that in for these um, conditional minimizers, and then get something that you can compute. Okay, so here we introduced this, so we localized the Hamiltonian, and what we're gonna prove is all the conditional minimizers, the true minimizers, the conditional minimizers, all look like this object that I'm gonna construct, which is gonna be the minimizer to a local Hamiltonian. So here's the point of view, right? You got this H trace of V of your tridiagonal matrix plus you know, all this sum of the one minus all that gross stuff with the logs, okay? And you're gonna localize about some index, okay? So you freeze an index K, all right? And you wanna think, you know, the minimizer, this is something on a global scale, all right? And you think of an index such that K over N is some T, T between zero and one, okay? Then you go into that Hamiltonian, which may be, let me go back, I, know this is, I should have rewritten it again. Here's this animal, right? You freeze an index K, and then from this object, you just, pull out only the terms that depend on a, k, and b, k, okay? You just, everything else you throw away, right? You only take the terms that directly interact with the index that you're thinking about, right? And then you say, well, my philosophy here is that all at, minim at the minimum, all those a's should be the same because the, the minimizer should be locally constant. So you just, you take only the A's and B's of index that, that are near this T, this chosen T, and then you, you set them all to be constants. And if you do that, you get a function of two variables. All right. Uh, you just set them to be, you set A. You say like, I have like, you know, maybe here, maybe I froze index 507, and when I look into the Hamiltonian, I have A507, A508, and I only get up to A510. I only take those, that stuff. And I say all the A's that appeared, I now announce you A, right? You're not A507, you're not A506, you're both just A, because you look the same. I think you look the same. Do you see you know what I mean? And now I get a function of two variables, all right? And so, so you're gonna get a function, we call this the local Hamiltonian about continuing position T. It's some polynomial in A and B, and this is what you get left over from the logs. And I define this thing to be the, the local Hamilton, the local minimizer is just the minimizer of this two-dimensional function, all right? And we prove that all the global minimizers, all the conditional minimizers are close to this thing, all right? And this thing we can actually compute, kind of, all right? So here's, I'm, I'm gonna end really soon. Here's one different version, one different characterization of this local minimizer that I will ask you not to look at. I was, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna close with a um, in kind of an extended remark that connects this local minimizer back to the equilibrium measure, which in essence, it's what it has to do, right? Because it, it's the only global thing in town. And you know, when you go into the, you know, the point of view of you know, the Riemann Hilbert world, I mean, you, 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 you pick a point, say, in the bulk, and you always have to mollify you know, the local density I mean, sorry, the, you know, the, um, the kernel by the local density. And so for us, the local minimizer is playing that role. And this local minimizer is directly connected to the equilibrium measure. So I'll just show you how that, how that works. Okay, so <clears throat> let me go back. Here is this local Hamiltonian, right? This is this function W that's just taking, right, just taking out the coordinates um, in the trace trace V of the tridiagonal matrix that you care about. Here's another way to write that local potential. I mean, a more analytic expression, okay? Here's what you do, you take that V and you evaluate it at A plus B, Z plus one over Z. You expand, Z is a, you know, a new parameter, a new variable. You expand this thing out 
is the Laurent expansion, you just take the first coordinate, the coefficient of the constant. I think why, why would that have anything to do with it? Because you have these A's and B's, when you compute traces of triagonal matrices, you know, you do some combinatorics, and it's like you're enumerating paths of a random walk. The A's are flat steps, the B's are up and down steps. And that's where this comes from, okay? But what's nice about this is because now you say, okay, this ridiculous W, which before was just go in, go in and find these entries you want and write them out. Wow. So th this systemizes it in a way. And you have integral formulas for um, the Laurent coefficient of a nice polynomial. And if you write those things out, and then you write out what it means to be a minimizer of that local Hamiltonian, you get these terrible looking equations. But for certain people in, on the planet, these equations aren't so terrible. Because what these equations are, so here's the deal. You write, so what is V sub T? V sub T was your, your potential multiplied by one over one minus T. And T is the position of your local minimizer, okay? So what you're saying is I wanna find LT and RT that satisfy these relations, okay? And then if you can do that, the local minimizer can be reconstructed from L and R. And you know what these L and R are? They're the following. They are the left and right endpoints of support for the equilibrium measure tied to this time-dependent um, potential, equilibrium measure, all right? So here's what my local minimizers are for this profile that I feed into this um, kind of you know, um, stationary phase problem. I go back to, um, I compute the equilibrium measure of VT, right, which is this modified potential, and then I find the, right, the left and rightmost edges of support, and I play this game. And those are the minimizers, right? And those are things I can say quantitative stuff about. And if I know that no matter what minimizer I look at, global minimizer, conditional minimizer, they all are pretty close to this. And this takes a lot of work, right? But if you can prove they're all pretty close to this, I feed into those, um, to those you know, mixtures of Gaussians, I feed in the same formula. And that's where the universality comes from. Because in all these blocks, you're computing these big Hessians at the same objects. And that's a little bit of a taste of where it goes. So, I'm gonna stop there. And, uh, yeah, so it's up to me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, thanks. Mm -hmm.